All right, we did start a series last week about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, depending on which uh, gospel you're reading. This week we're starting uh, a message connected called Good News of the Kingdom. I want to recap a couple things from last week because it's important. Uh, in the New Testament alone, in the NIV, the word kingdom is mentioned 152 times. Um, that's a lot, right? If somebody told you something, did anyone ever get one of those emails? And, and someone just keeps sending the email over and over and over. Okay, nobody? You got an email, and if you got an email 152 times, and we went through this last week, the power of repetition, eventually you're going to be like, all right, I'm going to read the email. All right, and someone keeps sending it over and over again. And, like, and, and just uh, in the Gospels alone, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the word kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God is mentioned 117 times. So that's the majority of where this is talking about. And we're going to see the majority of the time it's from the lips of Jesus. So we defined a couple of words. First one is the word kingdom. It means sovereignty and royal power. The word is used in this way in terms of kingship, authority, and rule. And we started to uncover, too, last week, that those words make us a little bit nervous because we don't like that idea of somebody ruling over us or authority uh, sometimes. And so then there, this word sovereign simply means this, supreme authority and power. I like to sum this up by saying, ultimately, what this means is God is in control. Amen? Amen? And sometimes we have to realize that if someone's in control, then they have to have supreme authority and power. That means they can actually be in control. Because we live in a world where people might assume certain levels of authority and power, but oftentimes we find they are limited to a certain extent. God is not limited. Amen. That's it. Let's go home. That's no, just kidding. So we talked about that Jesus spoke from Isaiah 61. And he spoke about the kingdom of God, and he used this term right in the beginning. It's from Isaiah 61. I'm going I'm to re, um, re-speak it. Here we go. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. I'm going to say it again, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So we see a bunch of actions just in these words, and, and Jesus stands up. We started reading in Matthew last week, then he says, this is being fulfilled in your presence. He only uh, quoted the first two verses. We read the whole uh, chapter of Isaiah 61. But here's some things in here that, that we can pull out. These are the action things that are in these verses. We need to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim freedom for captives, release from darkness for prisoners, proclaim the Lord's favor and his vengeance, comfort all who mourn, provide for those who grieve, Give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning, garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. How many people have ever gone to the store with a, a grocery list? Okay? How many people have forgotten that grocery list? That's just a side note, okay? Right? We, so we take a picture of it, we try to put it on our phone, but when you get there, right, you're going down a list. And what happens when you get home and someone says, did you get this? And you're like, ah. Oh. I totally forgot, even though I had a list. And so I, I want you to understand that this is a list. It's not an exhaustive list. But there's a certain thing that we can get encouraged. And, and Jesus says, oh, you know, I, I'm fulfilling this. And then he, he's sharing, as we're starting to see, this is part of the good news of the kingdom. This is what the kingdom looks like. This is the good news that we're proclaiming. But I want you to think about this truth first. You can't give what you don't have. If we're going to give something out and say, well, I don't have this, but I want to tell you all about it, but I, I, you know, it's just a pipe dream. It's just something that I, I think could happen, but I've never experienced myself. That'd be kind of tough, right? Somebody coming to sell you a car and say, well, I've never driven this car. I've never actually been inside of it. I'm just going to read off a list of things about it, but I'm sure it's a great car, right? Most of us start backing away from that person at that moment. Like, I'm not, I don't really know. But this is an even bigger concept. 
And I want to understand that sometimes why we don't spread the good news is because maybe we haven't experienced the good news in a full, complete way. And then we get pressured, right? Are we, are we expected to have this list all of the time? Where could we possibly get all of this in one place? Or in one person? Let's discover it together. There's this beautiful poem. It's in the book of Isaiah. The city of Jerusalem has just been destroyed by Babylon, a great kingdom in the north. And all of these Jewish people, they've been sent away into exile, but a few remained in the city. And they're left wondering, what just happened? Has our God abandoned us? Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They had turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls. And far out on the hills we see a messenger and he's running towards the city. He's running and he's shouting, good news. And Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Beautiful feet? Yes. The feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? that despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king, and that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Now in the New Testament, we find this same phrase, the good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, and it's also sometimes translated with the word gospel. So when Christians say, do you believe the gospel, they mean, do you believe the news? But not just any news. In the Bible, this phrase is always about the announcement of the reign of a new king. And in the New Testament, the Gospels use this phrase to summarize all of Jesus' teachings. They say that he went about proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus saw himself as the messenger, bringing the news that God reigns. Yes, but the way that he described God's reign, it surprised everybody. I mean, think, a powerful, successful kingdom. It needs to be strong, able to impose its will, able to defeat its enemies. But Jesus said the greatest person in God's kingdom was the weakest, the one who loves and who serves the poor. And he said that you live under God's reign when you respond to evil by loving your enemies and forgiving them and seeking peace. This is an upside down kingdom. Now Jesus also said that this kingdom was arriving with him. Yeah, so for example, there's this really interesting story where there's a high ranking Roman officer and he comes to Jesus begging him to heal his servant. And he even calls Jesus his Lord, acknowledging that Jesus is his authority. Jesus praises this man for recognizing what no one else yet had, that not only was Jesus announcing God's kingdom, he was the king. And so the word gets out that this Jewish man from Galilee is talking and acting like he's the king of Israel. He's appointing 12 disciples, which are an image of Israel's 12 tribes. He's healing people, forgiving people their sins. And all of this so threatened Israel's leaders that they finally decide to have him killed. And Jesus let them. Yeah, which is a weird thing to do if you're trying to become king. That's right. But for Jesus, this is what had to happen. Jesus saw the sin and the devastation of his people Israel as just one small part of the entire human condition. How all humanity has rebelled against God, resulting in the tragedy and devastation of our whole world. So how is God going to bring his reign over such a world? Jesus believed it would be through an act of sacrificial love for his enemies. This is why in the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion is depicted as his enthronement as the king of the Jews. Yeah, he receives a crown. He also receives a robe. He's exalted up, not onto a throne, but onto the cross. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And the good news now is that Jesus has defeated death and that he reigns as king, that he's dealt with our sin and corruption himself and that he's conquered it with his life and with his love. 
And then Jesus sends his followers to go out and keep announcing this good news of the upside down kingdom. And to invite everyone to give their allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. That good news? Let's dig in and we're walking through the book of Matthew. I'm going to read some verses and I'll throw some up on the screen. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Verse 23 says this, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. I want you to understand what this means, outside of what we're discovering already. The idea of proclaiming good news means this, to announce glad news, to be a messenger, to preach, to publish, to shoe forth. Anybody ever shoe forth something? Probably not in a while, but, right? To bear, bring, carry, to tell good tidings. Think about this now. When people have something exciting to share, someone gets engaged, someone's having a baby, right? This news goes forward, and what? It's happy news. People are excited. What the, the, the downside of our world now is that, that bad news and rumors spread faster, <laughs> Right? Isn't that often the case? And so I want you to understand that even then, Jesus is proclaiming this good news and going against the tide of culture. And and that same thing is going to happen today. Let's keep reading. He's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. So there's a couple things that Jesus is doing in these verses. The first one is teaching. Jesus is concerned about our understanding. And you would think if he's so concerned about our understanding, why in the world would he talk in parables sometimes and make it really confusing? No, no one ever thought that. He even had to explain it to the disciples sometimes. But he's, he's concerned for our understanding because sometimes he wants us to go deep. Those of us that have been here Wednesday night, right, we've been learning how to put our scuba gear on and, and dig in deep. And, it, and, and that takes time because some of us is like, oh, I just want to go deep. I want to go deep. Well, until you learn how to do the basics and do surface things, then you can go deep. And so Jesus is concerned about this. This is why it says he's teaching. He also says he's preaching. Jesus has an ultimate concern for commitment. There is a difference between teaching somebody something and then the idea of preaching. How many of us have ever said that our parents were preaching at us? Come on. You maybe never said it to them, but man, they're just preaching. And what, what, and now as a parent, right, what do, what do we, what do we say that we are? We're, we're concerned about our child's commitment to their academics, to the Lord, to their job, whatever it may be, right? And that's sometimes why we preach. And the last part is healing. Jesus was concerned about wholeness. He heals in all different ways, amen? And he doesn't just target one area, he's looking for wholeness. So he's concerned for our understanding, our commitment, and and wholeness. So Jesus is teaching and preaching. It's authentic, there's miracles happening, proving who he is. Our life should also authenticate whose we are, whose kingdom we are about and in and serving. It should be obvious. Let's keep reading Matthew chapter 5. You'll know these verses. Jesus saw the crowds. He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and, said, uh, came to him and he began to teach them. He said, starting in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the 
the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Many of us don't right, get rejoice and be glad when we hear that stuff's going to happen because of our stance, because of our faith in the Lord. Now, this is known as the Beatitudes, and there's a lot in here. I'm going to focus just really on the two verses that mention the kingdom. Uh, I want you to understand, though, there's things about the Beatitudes. There are several ways to understand them. One, there are a code of ethics for the disciples and a standard of conduct for all believers. Number two, they contrast kingdom values, what is eternal, versus worldly values, what is temporary. Third thing is they contrast the superficial faith of the Pharisees with the real faith that Jesus wants. And the fourth thing, they show how the Old Testament expectations will be fulfilled in the new kingdom. So it's aspects of all of these happening in this teaching. And, and the idea in these verses, the two that talk about kingdom, the one is the blessed is the poor in spirit. Uh, Luke uses poor, Matthew uses poor in spirit. Probably, and, and so of course the, the thing is, is he talking about finances or is he talking about an emotional, spiritual thing? It's probably both in certain aspects, because both could definitely be correct, because somebody in a different economic, they're in an economic difficulty or a social, emotional distress, the same thing is happening. They need to have confidence in God. Amen? So it doesn't really matter how it comes. And sometimes that, either one of those situations, we have to realize, and I want you to understand this truth as we continue to move forward, we are bankrupt without kingdom riches. And that doesn't always mean money. <laughs> that the idea of I'm investing in a kingdom, that it's eternal, it's lasting, it's something real. In the other verse regarding the kingdom, it says that we will be persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And that, that, that's going to come through when we stand and we live for what the kingdom of God is all about. Well, I want to jump to Matthew chapter 9. Put the verses on here. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Remember that verse. Verse 37, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. How many people have heard this verse before? Right? We've heard it. If we've been around church at any amount of time, we've heard this. Right? This is usually the pastor's plea for you to volunteer in the church. <laughs> and it can definitely start there. But this is a much bigger concept that Jesus is talking about. It can start there. But it's a proclaiming. It's your words, then backed up with, action. And that's so important when it comes to our faith. Do we think this has changed, this, this last verse? Anybody? Has this changed? Oh no, the workers, we have so many we don't know what to do with, just go home. <laughs> right? This verse is still so totally appropriate. Thousands of years later, isn't that, is that, I don't know if that's encouraging or we should be like, wow. Notice what this verse assumes, that you're already working. You're not praying for somebody else to do it. Oh, Lord, send in some people so I don't have to do it. <laughs> right? Well, sometimes we think that. And we've talked about this before, that, that we can easily compare and say, oh, somebody else does it better. Uh, but think about this. Like, there needs to be more people about this. This is, this, Jesus is proclaiming the good news. He, he has compassion on them. And then he says to his disciples, we need to pray for, for more workers. We need more help. The harvest is now. Think about this in verse 36. I'll jump back there for a second. It says that he had compassion on the crowds because they were harassed and helpless. Do you know people that are living life right now and they're harassed and they're helpless? That's how they might define themselves. They just feel helpless. 
They feel like everything's harassing them. Uh, work's demanding this. My family's demanding this. My fill in the blank. is demands. And we know people like this. And, and what does this verse say that Jesus says? Because they have no shepherd. The definition of shepherd means this. Someone who the Lord raises up to care for the total well-being of his flock. Now, some people say, that's your job, Pastor Keith. You're the shepherd. Okay? Yes, that is a role of a pastor. And so, we can, that's a whole other sermon series, which I've preached on before, what that means. But I want to let you know, I have prayed for you, by name, knowing often situations that are going on. And I prayed for you based off this verse. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers. We need to be kingdom-minded. We really, we really do need to realize we have good news to share, and that that needs to compel us. Jesus didn't make them feel bad, or just say we're understaffed, and you shouldn't either. I want to read, lately I've just wanted to read full chapters of scripture. I'm going to do that. So right after this, okay, I want you to understand. So Jesus is proclaiming the good news. He has compassion for the harassed and helpless. He says, man, they're like a sheep without a shepherd. He tells the disciples, we need to pray. We need to pray for more workers. He didn't say, you're doing a bad job. He said, we need, we need more. And then this is what he says. I'm going to read through Matthew 10. Jesus called his disciples to him, and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve... Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any towns of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You'll be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. Don't you think one of the disciples would have interrupted him right there? Like, wait, 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 what did you just say? On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. 
But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. There's a lot in there. I'm not going to unpack it. I just want you to hear it. Jesus starts. We read that part. And then this is what he gives the disciples. I mean, they're probably like, okay, what? And think about this. If you have good news... When you're having a conversation with someone, what often happens? Somebody will start saying, well, I want to know about construction. I, I, and you think of somebody. I say, oh, do you need to talk to Tor? Tor does construction. I know somebody who does that. When you're interesting, it, someone brings up the, the topic of farming. You're like, oh, you need to talk to the Krupskis or Dorothy. They do that for a living. They, they are familiar with that, right? You start to relay that, right? You want to learn about cooking? You talk to my wife. You want to be famous on the internet? You see the mealies. <laughs> but think about this, right? We often have no problem referring somebody to somebody else and say, oh, they know all about that. We have the answer. When someone is helpless and harassed and going through stuff, say, oh, you know what? I, I know who can help you. Oh, really? <laughs> they might be thrown back when you mention the name of Jesus. But I want you to put this in real context. What does it mean to just go around proclaiming the good news? Was Jesus running around going, good news, good news? Right? No, that's a summary of, of what he was sharing. Here's a great picture of what it might look like when we share Every Sunday I see you guys come in here from your church and don't get me started on your tipping. The girls gotta eat, right? It's just a little server humor there. But seriously, I don't know everything that goes on in there, but I know something does because I hear you. Every time I drop by your table, I hear how great the message was from the pastor and how you wish more people would hear it. Well, I don't go to your church, so how am I gonna hear it? All I got is you. So are you going to share it with me or just hope I stumble through the doors of your church with my sinful self? Well, since I have you here right now, I guess I can talk to you since it seems like you're not ready to talk to me. Oh, but you're ready to judge me, my hair, my clothes, my language, my music. I know that you don't mean for it to come across that way, but you have to see how it looks from my side. You think I have a problem, that my life needs fixing, that there's something missing in it and you have it, or at least you know what can fill that missing part. Okay, yeah, there's a part of my life that needs to be filled with something, but believe me, I've tried. I've tried to figure out what would make me happy. I've tried to figure out what would, I don't know, not make me feel like I'm worthless. Okay, so I'm not the greatest of people, but if I'm so lost and so far gone, aren't you the one that's supposed to help me? Aren't you the one with this so-called good news that is supposed to tell me the truth? Because what I've been trying is not working. And I need to know that there is more than just coming in here every day, serving you your coffee and pancakes to your lovely family. I need to know that there is more to my life than this. And guess what? You have to be the one because no one else is saying the things you say. 
How much do you have to hate someone to keep what you have to yourself and your family? How much do you have to like your own comfort to leave me to myself? I need you. Okay, I said it. And if you think that that was easy for me to say, then you try living my life. I need you to pursue me. I need you to set aside your comfort and pursue me because I'll run. When I get scared, I run. And you have to come after me. You have to follow me into the darkness and show me the way out because you were there once. You went from death to life. And I know that those are your words, but if it's true, then this is more important than your safety and your ego. Oh, I'm still gonna call you a Bible thumper and I'm probably gonna make fun of you, but don't give up on me. Okay, talk it over, I've got tables. It's your move. people just like this in real life. Someone's giving signs that they're brokenhearted. They're needing freedom or release from darkness. They need to know God's love and sometimes know God's judgment. And we have to figure out which balance of that to, to give. The whole truth. Someone's giving signs that need, need comfort. They're grieving and they have a need. They need to be encouraged. And maybe they're a little repentant, but they don't know what to do with that. Maybe they're in mourning. Maybe they're in despair. That list is just from Isaiah that we read in the beginning. I adapted it to sound a little bit more like modern English, but it is. It's the same things. And Jesus says, I've come to do that. Does that mean we're like, oh, good, let him do it? No, he's called us to do it. We need to proclaim that good news. And I don't stand up here and tell you, oh man, every time I just knock that out of the park, every opportunity I have. But I'm grateful for the times I do. Recently, many of you know that uh, I go every six weeks for an infusion of medicine, and I sit there for hours. And normally, what I normally do, just so you know, I bring my noise-canceling headphones, (laughs) and I sit on my phone, because I can't really go anywhere, and just do whatever. Play a game listen to a podcast, listen to music, read, whatever it may be. But a few months ago, I started chatting with my nurse. And let's be honest, sometimes we're like, I, you know, I'm just doing my own thing. Like, and, and the conversation started. And it was amazing. Right away, we found out there was connections. That he and I had people that we knew, and it just started to happen in the church world, but he was not a believer. Let's just say that. But I listened. And I remember at that moment, like, okay, I'm here now for a different reason. And praying in that moment, like, God, give me some words to say. And I'm not going to tell you that, oh, there was this radical salvation, and he dropped to his knees, and we prayed. But I I knew in those moments, I could feel the Holy Spirit saying, okay, like, use his opportunity. I tried to keep the conversation going, and chatting, and just listening. And I don't know if he had, I could, I don't know any of the background, but I don't know, sometimes people don't have a Christian that will listen. Just, uh, what have you got to say? And I kind of try to do my best to draw that out. I don't care if you're doubting. Let me hear what you, what's your opinion? What's your thought? And I definitely remember that I prayed in that moment. For the next couple of days, I continued to pray. What the interesting thing is, he's never been there again. Since I've been there, I'd seen him before. I haven't seen him again. But every time I'm back in there, I remember to pray for him. I don't know what's happening and going on, but that seed has been planted. Definitely shared. Told him that I was a pastor, you know. It's usually a a very big uh, opener right there. What do you do for a living? Oh, well, (laughs) here we go, you know. But I want you to think about that. What's the good news? Do you remember the day where you came face to face with the fact that you needed Jesus. Maybe that day will be today. But for those who it happened sometime in the past, do you remember that moment? Read through Matthew 5 again. Internalize the verses that we read. 
Ask yourself those hard questions. Are we? I mean, this is where we love to pull out that verse. Whoever takes up their cross and follow me, right? We want to, oh, let's take up our cross. Like, there's a lot going on here. Jesus is saying the, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. He's talking to the disciples that are following him. When we read that verse, we'll be like, oh, good, I'm glad somebody else is doing it. We have a job. We have a responsibility. And it's usually when we stop and take that moment and go, wow. And I love what that, that video just showed. She just said, you said, those are your words, that you were you know, from death to life, and you were there once. How easily we forget. And we start to look at people and like, ah, oh, I can't believe they're doing this. I can't believe they're doing that. And trust me, I've had those thoughts too, so you feel better about yourself. The pastor raises his hand first. Right? And it's very quick and easy to judge somebody else. But those moments where we're face to face with Jesus. If you're following Jesus, then I want you to do this today. Remember the good news. This is what communion's about. We're going to transition into communion in just a few minutes. It's realigning my head and my heart with what I actually believe. Being reminded, say, you know, this is really what it's all about. Knowing that Jesus changes everything. And I want you to return to the day that Jesus called you by name. And you know, many of you had that moment, and I've heard this testimony so many times, the pastor was preaching, and man, he was speaking right to me. And I was sure that my husband or wife or somebody in my family told them something. (laughs) Maybe it's today, maybe it's already happened. We've been reading the book of Matthew, so this seems appropriate as we get ready for communion this morning. Next. Besides, what else are you going to do with a mind like yours? Matthew. Matthew, son of Alpheus. Yes. Follow me. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what are you doing? You want me to join you? Keep moving, street preacher. Do you have any idea what this guy has done? Do you even know him? Yes. Listen, I said to... What are you doing? Where do you think you're going? Guys, let me go. Have you lost your mind? You have money. Quintus protects you. No Jew lives as good as you. You're going to throw it all away. Yes. I don't get it. You didn't get it when I chose you either. But this is different. I'm not a tax collector. Get used to different. I'm glad we passed by your booth today, Matthew. Yes. Shall we? We have a celebration to prepare for. You will regret this, Matthew. What's the tablet for? I grabbed it without thinking. You can put it back. No, no, keep it. You may yet find use for it. Where are we going? A dinner party. I'm not welcome at dinner parties. Well, that's not going to be a problem tonight. You're the host. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Are you all in? There's that moment where he's going to ask you to follow you. Follow him. (laughs) Will you follow him? Leave everything. 
If you haven't watched The Chosen, your pastor gives you permission to binge watch. Download the app and spend a couple hours, and it will move you back into the Gospels and want you to dig in and go, wow, this is amazing. And it, the call hasn't changed. We are at the same point again, face to face with Jesus, and say, what will we do? Will we follow? Will we give it all up? Will we seek our own comfort and our own protection, or will we go after him? I want you to think about the day that Jesus looked you in the eye and said, come follow me. And there's moments, right? You see Simon Peter say, don't you know who he is? Don't, 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 don't you understand? What's the, this list that we see in Isaiah that Jesus said, I'm coming to bring this ragtag group of people who are broken and, and are now healed and are changed. The church will continue to look like that when we are about the kingdom of God. Amen? You've heard me say it before, but the church will have to remain a hospital and a sanctuary at the same time. Oh, well, that, that's where it gets complicated. Absolutely. Be prepared for that. That will never change until Jesus returns. It's got to keep looking like that. Why? Because when we're about the business of the kingdom, we're going to go out to the people that Jesus went out to. Amen? And that's hard sometimes. Trust me. It's easy to sit back and like, oh, this is comfortable. I don't, I don't want my sanitized, and I'm not talking about hand sanitizer. <laughs> I'm talking about my sanitized space, and I want this, and I want that, and, and I want church, you know, everybody to be on the same page, and everybody to be the way I am, and think the way that I think. It's not always going to be like that. We're growing. Grateful that there's people who's new, who have walked with Jesus longer than I have, they can come alongside of us, but let us never forget that moment when we were face to face with him and he called us. And then go out and share that good news. There's so many different ways to do that. We're going to keep unpacking, mostly through the book of Matthew, but through the Gospels of how Jesus says this. The kingdom of God is like, and he's going to give example after example after example. But we can't just hear and say, oh, that's That's wonderful needs to be internalized. I want us to read these verses together. Gabby, you can come up. And uh, if you haven't already, if you are going to be part of our communion service, there's a little cups by the, the entrance. If you grabbed one or handed one coming in. And remember, communion is not just some religious thing that we do. This is that overflow, that going back to that moment where I said, yes, I remember the day that Jesus called me. And I responded with a yes. Because if we're honest, there's many times that we've stood there and we know Jesus had called us and we said, oh, I'm not ready for that. Maybe today is the day that you say a resounding yes. I want to read the instructions given to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about the Lord's Supper. And then I'll give you the instructions how to open this cup without spilling it all over yourself. So. It says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Here's what this means. The unworthy manner is you don't really believe or you don't get it. You're doing it because it makes you feel better and you don't have that moment where you responded yes to Jesus. If you have that moment and you know, you, you, whatever term you want to use, you ask the Lord into your heart, you ask him to forgive you, you said, here I am, God, do something, I need you. Whatever the sentence was, you have that moment, then, that, then you understand what this cup represents. And it's been backed up by your pursuing him after that. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Remember, that doesn't mean they got sleepy in church. That means they died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Isn't that often the case? We point the finger at somebody else and says, well, they're not, they're, I'm not as bad as them. Examine your own heart and your own life and your own commitment to the Lord. Has it been honest? Has it been authentic? God will let you know. I don't have to do that, right? It would be easier if it was like a, you know, those, 
we, everyone now has a digital thermometer, right? We can just test and be like, oh, you're in. But it's not, it doesn't work like that. God can read your heart and your life. He knows where you are. Verse 32 says this, When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined, so that we will not be condemned with the world. In Scripture, it also says that God disciplines those he loves. We don't like that, right? We're like, oh, because maybe we've seen poor discipline happen out of the wrong heart. But God does it out of a loving heart. So don't get nervous. Conviction, when you get convicted by the Holy Spirit, he draws you to himself. When you feel guilty, you want to get away from God. Just go, oh, get me out of here. I don't want to go to church anymore. I don't want to be around those people. It's the first thing that I've always seen being in ministry. It's hard to believe that it's almost 20 years when people are in sin, they start to point fingers at everybody else. That church, they judge me. <laughs> They're against me. They make me feel uncomfortable. And it's usually God working on them, not the church, not people around them. It says, then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. And so I will just tell you to wait till the end. That was not that direction. It was because people were just showing up to the communion feast to eat. Like, hey, this is great. And eat all the food. And that's, thankfully, you, well, not thankfully. I know some of you missed the bagels and the coffee. But we're here to partake in this communion together. All right. So there's two layers on this cup. One's a little clear layer. You pull that off first and you get this little wafer in here. I want you to just hold on to that. Don't go to the next layer yet. If you already did, then just hold on. And I want you to take some time to examine your heart and your life. You know. And here's what's even more revealing. God knows better than you. Even the things that you try to hide. Gabby's going to lead in a song. It's pretty much just the Lord's Prayer. We started service with that. And I want you to maybe pray that again. All right? it's, most of us learn that at some point in our life. Think about the words. Think about what Jesus is saying. Jesus is being very specific and intentional about that list. It's not about reciting a prayer out of some sort of repetition. It's about the meaning behind the words. But God, search your heart this morning. Take a few moments. And if you have to repent, we learned that last week, right? That's part of the kingdom of God. Repent kingdom of God is coming, is near. It's already here. It's began. Are you part of it? God wants to usher you into that kingdom and get you focused on something way more eternal than our temporary world. So let's get our heart and mind ready and just praying's talking to God. Take some moment, a moment this morning. Talk to him. Let him speak to your heart. And then we'll take communion together.
Will you stand with me this morning? And I pray that you took some time to remember why we bow to King Jesus. <laughs> it's not because he forces us, because he's some sort of dictator, like that first video showed. He was enthroned, a crown of thorns, a robe lifted up to die for our sins, to take our place. Many of us, when we put it in that context, we're like, wow, that's the king that we're bowing to. And then he defeated death and hell and the grave. That's the king that we bow to. That's the king that we want to spread the good news about his kingdom. All are welcome when they turn and they bow to King Jesus. Not out of having to, that he, that he invites them. Take the bread in your hand. I'm going to read the instructions. I'm going to pray, and then we'll take together. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, help us to be in awe every single time we take this bread in our hand. And we're reminded of the great love that you had for us. That while we were sinners, you died. You didn't wait around for us to get good or even to acknowledge what you did. You did it in spite of ourselves. And God will never be able to repay you, nor is that what you wanted. You want our full devotion. You want our heart and our head bowed to your lordship. And we're God, we're so grateful that we can trust you with our whole life, here, now, and for eternity. Help us never to forget what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the bread together. I'm sorry that I called it bread. It's not actually bread. I don't know what that is, but it's what it represents is important. Now take your that other layer here and pull that off the cup. You don't have to pull it off all the way, whatever you feel comfortable doing. I can know when everybody's ready because I still hear the crinkling of aluminum foil, so I'll wait. Here's the instructions given. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, that you poured out your life. Because our life, we don't have life without blood in our body. And you poured out your blood, and and it represents total forgiveness that we can be washed clean of every sin, of every mistake because you show us grace undeserved, unmerited favor, God help us to go out proclaiming that to those around us unmerited favor help us to show the grace that we receive when we didn't deserve it. The mercy that that we encountered when we didn't deserve it. We thank you so much that there is power in your blood, that there is still power in your blood. And God, you are worthy, and we are grateful that you loved us first. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take together. just want to encourage you this week to look for those opportunities. Sometimes we think we have to have a, you know, a sermon in our back pocket to spread the good news. Sometimes it's just a statement. Sometimes it's just our lives that someone might ask a question and we, and we see that opportunity and go, oh man, I could say something right now 
And I'm going to pray for you right now. That moment, you won't be overcome with fear. You'll become overwhelmed with the sense of, of wanting to share, that you can't hold back. That you're just like, I, I just have to share this with you. And you'll say something or do something this week. And I guarantee what will happen because it's happened to me. And many of it, you know that when you take that step and you step out in faith, isn't that the greatest feeling in the world? And you're like, oh man, why, why don't I do this more? This, 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 this is more exciting than anything. And again, you're not excited in yourself. You realize, okay, wow, God used me in that moment. God showed himself in that moment. The harvest is plentiful. Amen? Let's be one of the workers. Lord Jesus, I I ask that you prepare this church, everyone in this room, that we would not just be hearers of your word, but we'd actually do what it says. And God, help us to go out this week and proclaim your good news. We're going to encounter people with, with situations far beyond what Isaiah talked about. But you are still the answer and the remedy for every single situation that we come in contact with. Give us creativity and boldness as we share about you. As we share our story when we encountered you. When we apply a scripture that we've read and say, you know what has helped me? This has helped me. Jesus has changed my life. God, you are, you are amazing. And you are worth us getting a little uncomfortable and a little scared for people to, to be free for the first time ever by coming to know who you are. God, give us strength this week. Give us spiritual eyes that are open to see those around us the way you do. And then Holy Spirit, fill us with boldness and power to stand firm, to live out the gospel through our actions and our words. In Jesus' name, amen.